Hi, my name is Mara. Um, I'm a member of the Rust project. And today I'm going to talk to you about the evolution of the Rust language. Specifically, uh, I want to zoom into how a feature gets added to the language, to the standard library or its tooling. And this process starts with you, the user. You are working in Rust and you have any kind of problem. A stumbling block could be a big thing, something that's currently impossible in Rust, or it could be something small, some functionality you're missing in a standard library. Then you spend time thinking about that problem. You come up with an idea and eventually you write down your solution, you work it out. And eventually you can submit your solution as a proposal to the Rust project in the form of an RFC or an ACP. And if everything goes well, then in the end, the relevant Rust team will look at it and hopefully approves your proposal, after which um, implementation stabilization happens. Um, but that's not the focus on this talk. I'm going to start with a show of hands. How many of you are Rust users? How many of you have written any line of Rust code? Good. How many of you had any kind of problem in Rust? Anything where you thought like, oh, if only the language would work slightly different. I see a lot of hands down. Apparently, you all think the Rust language is perfect. That's great. I'd also want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> How many of you spend more than five minutes thinking about your problem? How many of you had an idea on how to solve your problem? Maybe you knew which method you wanted in the standard library, or you had an idea of which language feature would make your life easier. How many of you actually wrote it down in a blog post or RFC or anything like that? OK, OK. How many of you submitted an RFC to the Rust project? And how many of you? <laughs> And how many of you got their proposal accepted? <laughs> so at every step, there are fewer than before. And that makes sense in a pipeline like this. Um, but I want to zoom into how these things break down. And there's a few obvious ones, of course. Maybe you don't have time to think about your problem, or maybe you don't have enough context to, to come to a solution. Maybe you don't have time to write it down, or maybe your proposal gets rejected. Um, but let's zoom into one particular frustrating sequence of events that happens in reality a lot. It starts with a user and the Rust project, and this user has a problem. And in this case, it's a complicated problem, something where there's multiple possible solutions. It will interact with other problems. So this user wants to go come talk to us, the Rust project, because we have all the context, except we just don't have a process for this. We are the process for changing Rust is by submitting a solution to us. No, just a solution. But talking about problems, that's that's not yeah not something we we have a fixed process for. So you follow this process instead, where you think about your problem and you come up with the idea, you write it down, and you submit your solution to the project, and then we say no, because maybe your problem is a really important problem that we need to fix, but maybe your solution is actually not the right one. And this is a very frustrating moment, because this no doesn't mean that your solution isn't important, or your problem isn't important. But it does send you all the way back to step one. And then if you have more energy, you can do this thing all over again, take some of the feedback from last time, come up with a new idea, write it down, submit a new RFC. But there's still no guarantee that it will be accepted, and it might just be rejected again, sending you back to step one, at which point you might just do something else that's more fun. This, this slide represents frustration, frustration that quite a lot of people have experienced. Um, and the problem is this, this dotted line. Everything on the right side of this dotted line happens inside the REST project, but everything on this side is happens outside of it. You, you might be able to talk about it with project members, but it, it, it happens on it maybe on blog posts, but maybe on a whiteboard at your office, maybe just in your head all over the place, but it is not coordinated by the Rust project. So every time you come with a solution and it gets rejected, you get thrown over this wall and you're on your own again. So I want to talk about tracked and untracked work.
So looking at this picture, just like I mentioned, this part is what we track in the REST project. If you submit an RFC, it will become a pull request on the RFC's repository. You can see the discussion going on there. You can see whether it has been approved or not. The outstanding questions you can see after it's been approved, we, um, how do the all the steps of our stabilization? You can see how the implementation is going, etc. So we keep track of that, or at least we try our best. But all of this stuff is untracked. Um, we don't have an overview of all problems that you all have. Most of them we never even hear about because, well, with the show of hands, I saw that lots of people had problems that they just don't end up writing down because the only thing we accept as written down things are solutions, not the problems. So all of this stuff stays untracked and invisible to us. So let's take a look at uh, what we could track. Or at least what we could track if we had unlimited time and energy. We don't. The reason we don't track all that stuff is not because we hate you or we hate problems, just we don't have time. But imagine for a second we had infinite time and energy. Then, well, the, the, the most obvious thing we could start tracking is actually the problems themselves. Instead of just having an overview of all the solutions that have been tried and which ones have been accepted or not, we could start tracking which problems people have, which problems we're trying to solve. We could start tracking negative results because something that happens to me a lot and probably to others too is that I think I have some brilliant idea, I work on it for weeks or months and then in the end I realize that oh, it doesn't work. Just throw everything away. And that feels like a failure, like a waste of my time. But it becomes a failure if I don't write it down because then a few years down the road, someone with the same problem will do all that work all over again. But if we actually started tracking negative results, if I had a place to post my result, like, hey, I tried this, this doesn't work, then someone else could take that on um, and continue where I left off. The same for partial results. Maybe you don't have a full solution, but you do have idea, the, the, some key ideas towards the solution. And perhaps most interestingly, user research. You might have um, a lot of interesting information about how users use Rust. Maybe you represent a user group in, for example, embedded or game, or you might uh, have a lot of information about how Rust gets used at your company. Or you might spend a lot of time on GitHub code search and know all kind of patterns that appear in real world just co Rust code that point at a specific problem. So today, if you do any of that research, you don't have a way to submit that research to the project, only if you take that research and turn it into a proposal, a solution, and then you can come with that to the Rust project. Um, but we are not very good at tracking any of this, and that's a shame. So doing all this stuff is a lot of work. I'm not sure if we could. But if we imagine if we did track problems. Imagine that we had some sort of map where each of these blobs represents a problem. And it could be high-level problems, like performance and binary size, or it could be a, a specific use cases we care a lot about, like Rust for Linux or Embedded. And we could track all kind of low-level, more specific problems, like mutex poisoning or um, efficient string formatting. For each of these problems, we could keep track of negative results, partial results, ideas, and most importantly, how they relate to each other, which ones depend on each other, and any other kind of connections between these problems. If we had this map, then if we would, for example, prioritize binary size, if that's something we wanted to do, just an example, then we can look at this map and see which things relate to that. Just follow the lines down this graph and see which other things we should prioritize. While some of these things might be obvious, there will also be things there that are completely unobvious because they are several steps away. And this is exactly what Nico has been working on. Shout out to Nico over there. It, Nico has been working on... Um, <laughs> Nico has been working on something called Project Goals, a, a setting up a process for setting goals as a project as a whole, so we can actually, thank you, 
we can actually try to um, prioritize something not just per team or per person, but uh, as a whole, as project as a whole, because many efforts, like for example, binary size, require efforts from many different teams. Check out the RFC. Um, I think earlier today or maybe yesterday there was a blog post on the Insight Rust blog. I didn't have time to put it on the slide, but go check it out. Um, but if we had this map, then it would be a lot easier to see how all these things relate when you set a goal, which other goals you shouldn't forget about. Very similarly, um, this is very useful for funding. Imagine that the Rust Foundation gets a grant from some big company. Here's 2 million euros and go spend it on binary side on Rust for Linux because they tend to get funding for these high-level problems, not for the low-level ones. Then you can start to follow these arrows down and see what the money should be spent on. Because today, if you're working on refactoring bootstrapping and try to get money for that, you'll just get a no. No one cares about that. People care about that. And only with this map you can tell them, well, actually, if you want that, you need that. And finally, if you are a contributor who is working on a specific issue, for example, you're just hyper-focusing on extra types because it's just so cool to work on, then your world might look like this. You just focus on that particular thing. This happens a lot. <laughs> um, but with this map, you can zoom out and you can see how your problem connects to other problems. You can see, find connections between your problems, find connections between solutions, and most importantly, find connections between people because every single one of these blobs represents not just a technical issue, but they represent people, people with that issue, people that want to work on that issue, people with ideas, people you need to collaborate with, people you should talk to. So back to the main point of my talk. The entire point of this talk is let's talk a bit more about the problems instead of only focusing on the solutions. Let's focus more on this part of the process, because this part, we've been undervaluing it. We, we might need a bit of a culture shift where we start valuing problems and thoughts and ideas more, even when they don't necessarily lead to a solution directly. So the question is how? How do we do this? Start, do we start tracking every thought in the world about the rest? I, I don't think we can do that. There's, there's a few things we can do, like Nico's project goals is a great step towards this, but I don't have a full solution. I don't have the answer. So it might be a bit of an anticlimactic uh, uh, ending to my talk. I don't have an answer. I don't have a grand conclusion. But the entire point of the talk is that we should be able to talk about problems even when we don't have a full solution. Um, but I do know, I do know something. And that is that we should be making more connections. So I have two assignments for all of you. One, during lunch, which will start, start right after my talk, go talk to each other. Talk to someone you've never talked to before and tell them about a the Rust problem, your Rust problem, and listen about their Rust problem. And try to find a connection, any kind of connection. Because this picture today with this many people around looks like this. Many users, many problems, many thoughts, many ideas. And if we all start talking to each other about them, this picture turns to this. We can start combining our thoughts, finding patterns in problems. We can come up with bigger ideas. The second assignment I have is to come talk to us. Nico and I have set up a booth in, um, it's all the way in the other building at the far end. And you can come to us with your problems and bring us your Rust problems. We'll write them down and try to make them part of a bigger picture. And hopefully that will end up with something useful and exciting. So talk to each other, come talk to us. Thank you for listening and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>